Let's open up the word tonight to Psalm 119. Uh, we're going to be starting in one, uh, verse 105 tonight. As we just let God's word minister in the power of his word and just enjoy his word, let's pray as you guys are finding your way there to Psalm 119, verse 105. And let's pray. Father, we thank you again. What an honor it is to be able to open your word tonight. And God, we think about those who don't have that privilege and don't have that honor. And even, Lord, through the testing and trial of COVID, how many churches had to shut down and how many people were not able to hear the word of God, maybe through a computer, Lord, maybe in some other way, but it's just not the same as it is in person among your people and the moving of your spirit. And we thank you tonight that you've given us this great privilege to be able to come together, to break open the bread of life to hear your word and to read your word that you honor even above all your name as you tell us in Psalm 138. And tonight we're freely able to do that. God, our heart goes out to those who can't do that tonight. We think of our brothers and sisters and those that are not yet brothers and sisters in Cuba. We pray your mercy on them. We pray, God, that you would deliver them from this tyrannical communistic government, that you would set them free, Lord, and let them taste freedom. This might be their moment, Lord, to have a free nation. And uh, so have mercy on them, God. We pray you'd move in the leadership of our nation to stand with them and to back them. And God, we pray for our nation. We thank you for the freedoms you've given us. And Lord, let what's happening in Cuba be a reminder of those who turn away from you and turn away from your word and begin to let their freedoms slip away. Lord, even as we see our nation struggling to hold on to the freedoms you've given us, God, as we uh, foolishly allow some of them to slip, God, I pray you'd help us to stand firmly on your word and to be thankful for the freedom that you've given us. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we thank you for that, Lord. And tonight we pray that the liberty of your spirit would move freely among us, that you would pour out your spirit, that God, you would speak to us by your powerful word, the word of life. If there's any that don't know you tonight, regardless of how they're hearing this, they would come to know you through your word tonight. And God, you would honor your word through the teaching of your word. God, pierce our hearts. God, we're just anticipating you speaking in a great way. And so we give you full permission, Lord, and ask now that you would move as we honor you and honor your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get into Psalm 119, remember the premise. It is an acrostic psalm. That is, each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 of them, he uses eight verses apiece for each letter. And they're broken up in the groupings of eight verses, again, with each Hebrew letter starting each verse of those eight verses. Now, you don't see that. It doesn't translate into English, quite obviously, because it's a Hebrew. But that's what's happening behind the scenes. You know what's happening. And tonight, we come to noon. Uh, as he goes on again, remember the whole premise, honoring the word of God, exalting the word of God. God gives this entire psalm, the longest psalm in the Bible, just to honor his word and to speak of his word and to exalt his word and to glorify his word. And by the way, if you're not enjoying the riches of God's word, cry out to God and say, God, revive me, wake me up, stir me, get into the word of God, read the word of God, feast on the word of God, enjoy the word of God, fall in love with the word of God, because it is Jesus manifested and revealed for us, you know, through his word. Word. And so when we're loving the word, we're loving Jesus. And we're loving Jesus, we're loving his word. And I think oftentimes a barometer of how we're walking with God is oftentimes defined by the love we have for his word. Now, I realize that uh, there are dry times. I know that. So we have dry times. It doesn't mean we don't love the Lord. I'm not saying that. But if you're not sitting and just enjoying the word of God, then I encourage you, cry out to God to give you that new fresh hunger and that desire. And as we're going to see tonight, when we get into it, I guess I'm just excited about God's word. We need to get into it and stop my word. But the bottom line is, <laughs> uh, we're going to see that God says, you know, uh, again, it's something we should cultivate, even in the morning times. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But notice here, noon, he goes on, a whole new fresh start with each of these eight verses. And the number eight in scripture representing the number of new beginnings. So it's almost like there's a new beginning and a new angle to the word of God with every eight verses and with every Hebrew letter that begins them. Here we are again. I love this. One of the, my favorite verses in all the Bible, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is it not? You know, you think about going camping. Those of you that have ever been camping or if you've ever been somewhere that's very, very dark and you can't see a thing. He's like, I can't see a thing to get around, whatever's going on. And you, all you need is a flashlight. You turn it on and you can clearly see where it is you're going. That's the picture it gives here uh, of God's word. We live in a dark world. It's very dark around us. Uh, people without the word of God can't see. People without uh, being able to have their spirit revived in the Lord can't see or understand. And we're surrounded by them. They don't see a clear path. They don't see a way, but we do. 
And God's word is that path. What do we do in times like this when we see a nation in turmoil like our own? Uh, when we see a, a nation turning against the word of God, when we see the church not even standing for the word that it way, the way they should in many areas, what do we do? Well, God's word is a lamp, a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. God, what do I do in my situation? And if you tonight are going, God, what do I do in my situation? Right now, some of you have a situation, you're going, I don't know what to do. Well, guess what? God's word is a lamp unto your feet and he's a light unto your path but you've got to get into his word. You've got to turn on the light and let God begin to show you the way to go and show you the path. God will be faithful to do that. And so uh, just, you know, again, opening our eyes and, and showing us the direction. I love it. Such a, a picturesque way there of, of seeing, you know, how we can see and how we find our way and direction, you know. And, and again, I think about the darkness I was in in the world, not understanding, not knowing the way. And then we have now God's word to direct that. He says, I've sworn and I've confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. And he goes on now talking about his affliction. And throughout the psalm, we see different trials he goes through. But every trial, every affliction, everything he brings up in each of these section of verses, he turns it back to the word of God because that is the answer for everything, the word of God. And he says, he has more than several revive me's throughout Psalm 119. Here's another one. Revive me, O Lord, note this, according to your word. Are, are you dry? Do you need to be revived? Then it's according to the word of God that you get revival. That's how you get it. You're not gonna get revival any other way from, except from the word of God. You're not gonna grow any other way except the word of God. I see Christians who wonder why they're not growing. How come I'm not moving forward in the Lord? Why is God using other people and not using me? How much are you eating? How much are you feeding on the bread of life? This is how you grow. You're saved by simply the spirit of God, confessing your sin, repenting and turning to the Lord, believing he died for you on the cross. That's how we're saved. But you are not gonna grow if you don't get into the word of God. And it's a very sad thing for me to see Christians that have been walking with the Lord for 30 years, 35, 40 years, and they're really honestly still spiritually children. Now, I don't tell them that. But I, it's not a matter of pride. It's not an issue of, oh, I think I'm so whatever this. That's not the point. But you can tell those that have applied themselves to eating food so they can grow in the Lord and those that have stunted growth. And he says here, God, revive me according to your word. I need, I need new life. I need refreshing. I need God's spirit. And again, you say, well, I'm dry. I read the word. It seems dry to me. All the more reason we need to read it. Say, God, you said you would revive me according to your word. This is your promise. I'm taking you at your word. Revive me. Open it to me. Pour out your rain on me and begin to read it and God will revive us according to his word. That's where revival comes. And by the way, every great revival has always been preceded by the teaching of the word of God. There's not a revival in world history that I know of that didn't start with someone teaching the word of God through the Bible. It doesn't exist. You go back and look at all of them. They all, they all began that way. And then what happened after the word of God was being taught, then God began to pour out his spirit. And that's when you saw the revival of the Spirit come. But it always begins with the Word of God. So revive me, O Lord, according to your Word. Except I pray the free will offering of my mouth, O Lord. No one's making me honor you, God. No one's making me praise you. I'm freely doing this. It's a free will offering. God, accept it. And teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. You know, so, you know there's all these treacherous things facing me, but I still run to your Word, God. I'm, your Word is a constant. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Again, everything pointing back to the answer in the scripture. Your testimonies I've taken as a heritage, or we would say inheritance forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Is God's word the rejoicing of your heart? You know, if it's not, again, cry out, God, make it the rejoicing of my heart. Revive me according to your word. You read the word of God. Sometimes I just read God's word. Now I'll pray, God, open your word to me. Just open it, God. I want to know your word. And the quiet of the morning or whatever, and God will begin just to speak, and there's just a rejoicing of the heart. It's just, it, it, you've experienced that as believers. It can't be put into words. The world doesn't understand it. God begins to do things in us through the teaching of his word. He begins to awaken us and bring us alive he says, I've inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. So have the psalmist, you know, Lord, I made up my mind. I'm going to follow your word for eternity. I'm never going to turn away. Have we, have we focused our heart on that? You know, we made our mind up. Lord, I've inclined my heart. I'm going to stay with your statutes, with your word forever to the very end. So there's no turning away. This is my commitment. Again, as, as, as Peter said, Lord, where would we go? You hold the words of life. 
There's no other way to go. And so we end uh, noon, the next eight verses, with just, again, the psalmist uh, uh, making that commitment to God's word forever. Now we come to Samach. He says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. Again, you remember in scripture, double-minded means having your mind, in, obviously, in two places, partly in the world, partly in the church. Um, and there's probably nothing more miserable than that. You know, if you, if you have your, your mind in the world, your thoughts in the world, and your thoughts also in the church, then you're a miserable person. Here's why. Because you've got just enough of the world where you can't really enjoy the Lord because you feel convicted all the time. And you've got just enough of the Lord that you can't enjoy the world. So if you decide to sneak into sin a little bit, you're convicted the whole time. And if you decide to get back toward the Lord, then the, the, the same thing's there. Now you're feeling guilty because you know you're not living for God the way you should. Get off the fence. Plunge into the word of God. You're not gonna be disappointed. Say, God, I'm all in for you. This is where I'm gonna be. And how many of us walk along that fence? How many Christians walk along that fence? We need to make that choice and just jump into the field with God's sheep, go for it full throttle and say, God, I'm here and I'm chosen to serve you. I'm gonna follow you, I'm yours. And so he makes the comment, the double-minded. He says, that's not where I wanna be. I love your law. That is your word. You, I love this, notice this, you are my hiding place and my shield. And he talks about where he's gonna hide and, and what his shield is from the enemy and from the world. And he says, Lord, that's you. It's not just something I do. You are that hiding place. You are that shield. It's you. I hope in your word. Again, where do we put our hope? If we're putting our hope in other things, it's gonna let us down. It's gonna be a failure. If we put our hope in the word of the Lord, it will never fail. God will be faithful. We may have to wait for a while, we learn to wait on the Lord, but, but our hope is in his word. God will be true to his word. And notice now he, he reveals some of the persecution he's getting from the wicked around him. He says, depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Again, I think about those that mock us because of our faithfulness to the Lord, that mock us because we believe the Bible, that mock us because you know, we're, we're Christians or we think that there's right and wrong in the world, you know, we, instead of just accepting everything that's thrown our way. And, and here he says, you know what? I, I, just depart from me. I will keep the commandments of my God. I encourage you tonight, regardless of the pressure you get to go along with the world and to compromise, make up your mind, I will keep the commandments of the Lord. And if that means at your workplace or among your family, they're gonna make fun of you because you believe the Bible, then so be it. Let them make fun of you. You know, people say, you're such a fool for believing that. Well, I'll be a fool for Jesus if that's the case, because in the end, we're gonna find out who the real foolish person is. You know, the Bible says that God be shown to be true and every man a liar. And none of us are gonna regret the fact that we've stood with the Lord and stood on his word. And he says, I'm keeping the commandments. I'm standing with the word of God. And by the way, you know, again, God's word will always show itself to be true. You know, this whole thing now, you know, again, if you keep up with kind of the science reviews and what they're writing out there, maybe you don't even know this. It's not kind of common knowledge, but even the, the unbelieving scientists are pretty much debunking evolution now. If you read any of the science manuals and some of the guys that are higher in that, in that area, they'll come out and say, traditional evolution is, is pretty much wrong. We now admit that. We're not giving up on evolution. But because then where else do you have to go but to God? But they will admit in their writings, many of them, some of these you know, names you might recognize, Tim, you know, not Tim Hawkins, I think he's a, a comedian. But... <laughs> anyway, I, I, anyway, certain, certain, <laughs> certain of, these, of these names you would recognize, I just can't remember. They're coming out and saying, um, uh, maybe it's Dawkins, maybe I'm thinking of Dr. Dawkins. Anyway, anyway. Um, they're pretty much saying, look, evolution we now know is, is really scientifically impossible because now as we do the numbers and calculations, we realize there isn't enough time, even when we put that long time scale, there's not enough time to reach all the zeros that are coming after everything we're trying to put together. So it could never happen that way. However, we now believe they've changed it because now they've proven that that's false. They've now moved to what they call quantum evolution. Maybe again, if, you're, if, you, like, if you read some of the science things, you know what I'm talking about. And they say that what happened was it would appear, and, and also this explains why we can't find any transitional bones because it just happened in big chunks all of a sudden. So what they're saying is, all of a sudden one day there wasn't you know, a, an animal and poof, then there was, right? It was, it was a rapid evolution. Well, that's called creation, okay? <laughs> it's amazing to me how foolish. Now here's the thing. For those of you years ago that were being made fun of, about evolution. I can't believe you're so stupid. You believe the Bible. Look, I may not be a scientist. I don't understand science, but God said he made it in six days. I'm gonna believe him. You stood in the right place and now you're being vindicated. 
Even by the science community behind the scenes, you're being vindicated. Now, they might not come out and admit that, but that's happening uh, behind the scenes right now. Uh, so it's, it's, it, here's the bottom line. Trust in God's word. You'll never be ashamed. The world will mock you. They will make fun. They'll say there's no way that this could happen or whatever. This, the question is, how big is your God? If your God is so small that can't happen, you've got the wrong God anyway. If your God is the one that said, let there be light, and there is, and by the way, it came by the, by the use of his word and the power of his word, there's nothing impossible for God. You know, God says, I'm going to do it. I will do it. That's our God. And so he says, I don't care about the mockery people give me. He says, I'm going to keep the commandments of my God. He says, uphold me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Oh, they're trying to make me ashamed of my hope. They're trying to make me ashamed of your word. They're trying to mock me because I believe this really happened or what, et cetera, or whatever the case might be. But Lord, I'm seeing that your word indeed is true and what you said happened has really happened. And the science is backing it up. See, the amazing thing to me is whenever someone attacks the word of God, science always backs it up. And we don't need that. You know, God is able to do it without that. He doesn't, and, and, and just to believe him is a wonderful thing to know the power we have in our God. But the same thing he's saying here is, God, don't let me be ashamed because I've stood on your word. And I'll tell you this, if you stand on the word of God, you will never be ashamed. You may be mocked in this world, but when you stand before God, you're not gonna be ashamed. Let me give you a worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, you stand before God and God says, wow, you really believed my word, didn't you? Well, that really wasn't what I meant, but boy, way to go. Okay, now that's not gonna happen. Because God means what he says, right? But that's worst case scenario. Here's the other scenario. Why didn't you believe my word? Well, because men, they told me that that was impossible. The people, my scientists and professor, really. You mean fallen man? Well, yeah, but these guys were smarter than most fallen men. Well, if they're fallen, wasn't their brain, did it start out fallen or did it start out good? Well, it started out fallen. So you took some man that I created who has a fallen brain and put him above me and my word that I said I hold even higher than my name, and you believe that? Well, if you put it that way, that was pretty silly, Lord. Let's not be that person. His word is above even all his name. Man is fallen, he is not. The most intelligent being down here has no clue compared to the glory of God. If we simply believed his word, you know, he talks in the Psalm, Lord, you've made me smarter than my teachers. You've made me smarter than the ancients. Did you know the Bible tells us that the, the Bible tells us the earth is round? The Bible says that God sits above the circle of the earth, not the circle of the land, not the circle of the sky, as though it only covers that area. He says the circle of the earth. So he identifies the earth as being what? Round. It is circular. You know, we didn't know that until we were able to do proper scientific calculations and fly out in space and see it. We didn't know that. Can you imagine? That's Job writing that. Lord, you sit above the circle of the earth, the psalmist says, and that's actually in Psalms, and then Job talks about it as well. The bottom line is that we simply believe the word of God. These things, Job says, Lord, you turn the wind to the north, you bring it back around. He gives this whole thing where he talks about how the winds of the world work. And at that time, now we know scientifically exactly what Job said is exactly what happens. It's how the winds rotate on the earth. It's very consistent. It lines up exactly with how Job said it. We didn't, Job didn't know that. We couldn't know that. Job writes, Lord, you've, the psalmist rather said, Lord, you've, 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 you've shown yourself in the paths of the sea. Guess what we found? Paths in the sea. We now know where the paths in the sea are. We found them after that was written, many years after, because a believer saw it written in the Psalms and said, if God said there's paths in the sea, there have to be. And they began to examine the oceans and found that there's paths in the sea. And now they're the shipping lanes that our ships use crossing the, the oceans of the world because it speeds them up. It's like the jet stream in the air. Again, I, we could go on all night about just uh, the, the truthfulness of God's word. And, I, and I, I tongue in cheek say science is slowly catching up, but really that's the truth. Science is slowly catching up with the word of God. How foolish to put our faith in science and professors and universities and people with fallen brains who are just not slowly catching up with the Bible. When God said, if you'll just believe me, I'll just tell you what's happening. I'm like, all right, Lord, fill me up. Let's go. Tell me, this is exciting. And he says, all right, here's the deal. And so we stand before the Lord, you know, believing in, and hoping in his word. Lord, let me not be ashamed of my hope. That's your word. I believe in it. Hold me up and I shall be safe. And I shall observe your statutes continually. You reject all those who stray from your statutes for their deceit is falsehood. 
You put away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Again, dross is the bad stuff when you're purifying uh, uh, you know, precious metals like gold and silver. You burn off the bad stuff, which is the dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I'm afraid of your judgments. This is not a cowering fear. This is a respect and a reverence. God, you are so great. I tremble at your greatness. I fear your word. I fear you. You're a great God who will give a reckoning. Every man will give a reckoning to one day. And how wonderful that day we stand before the Lord to know, you know what? I messed up a lot, but I put the blood all over me. And I'm just, that's, I'm standing here under the blood right now. And that's what I stand in and on. And I'm not departing from it. Isn't that great? The blood of the Lord. That's why we rejoice. All right, great. Now we come to the next ayin, uh, the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the next eight verses. He says, I've done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. So a cry now for God's delivery uh, uh, by his word, he'll say, for be surety for your servant for good and do not let the proud oppress me. Again, surety means a guarantee. So be a guarantee for your servant for good and don't let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. Again, do your eyes, your eyes get tired? You've read the word so much? Wow. Think about that. You know, my, my eyes are tired just from reading your word, God. I've sought your word so much that I just need to let my eyes rest, you know? And, and again, this, you see the love that he had for God's word, the desire that he had for God's word. It should make us jealous. Deal with your servant according to your mercy. Now, this is huge because we don't want to go to God and ask for mercy based on uh, anybody else's mercy, you know, or, or based on how we've lived or what we've done or anything else. We want his mercy because we're all guilty before God. So, Lord, deal with us. Deal with me, he says, according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding. What a great prayer that I may know your testimonies. Guys, what a great, great prayer. You get along with the Lord and say, God, give me understanding. Give me wisdom. I encourage you, pray what Solomon did. Lord, I'm only a child. You know, when Solomon prayed that prayer, most scholars, again, according to what we can determine from the scriptures, he was probably around 40 to 45 years old. He said, I'm a child. I need wisdom. Look at the humility and the truth of it. It's compared to what God's wisdom is and what, what he needed to lead God's people. He needed God's wisdom. He needed God's understanding. What, what do you need just for your family? You know, dads, what do you need to lead, lead your home? You know, husbands, wives, to be the wife God wants you to be. You know, we need God's wisdom and God's understanding. What a great prayer. I'm your servant, Lord. Give me understanding. I need to know what to do that I may know your testimonies. I love this. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Is that not appropriate today or what? It is time. God, move. We need you to move in our nation. We need you to move in the church. We need you to pour out your spirit. We need you to revive your people, God. Bring your people back to life. Wickedness is flourishing. Darkness is surrounding us. It is time to act, O Lord. And again, God knows what time it is to act, but what a great prayer to pray. For they've regarded your law as void. I mean, think about it. How many people, especially in our leadership today, uh, in, our, in our governmental leadership, from the lowest level to the highest, how many simply just completely disregard God's word? Think about it. God's word is the standard for the universe. And yet if you were to walk in Congress today and say, look, the Bible says this, guys, what are y'all doing? You'd be laughed out of there. You'd be mocked out. They would, they would say, get this lunatic out of here who you know, believe in the Bible. And yet that is the highest standard of the universe. It is what we base everything on, the word of God. And so the psalmist sees this. And he's like, Lord, they're, they're, they're ignoring your word. Like it doesn't matter. They're pretending it's not important. It's time for you to act. Therefore, because it's time for you to act, and your word's the answer. I love your commandments. Again, do we love God's word? Do we love his commandments? More than gold, yes, than fine gold. He said, I don't care about the riches of the world. They're all gonna pass away. But God, your word lasts forever. We're not gonna care about what our bank account is when we stand before God. We're not gonna care about our gold or our collections or whatever. And again, I'm not talking about hobbies that might be fun, that kind of collection, but if we're trying to store up treasure or we're trying to do whatever, yes, use wisdom. We've talked about that, use wisdom. But if our hope is in that, it's, gonna, it's not even going to be around when we stand before the Lord. He says, I, I, it's your commandment that I cherish more than gold, even than fine gold. Therefore, not some, but all of your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. And I hate every false way. Do we believe everything God's word, in God's word, do we consider it to be right? Everything. Even the stuff we don't understand. It's like, Lord, I don't know what that's about, but I believe you. 
And maybe there's something I don't understand. Maybe there's something I'm not grasping. You know, sometimes we get hung up on parts of God's word and people get hung up because they say, well, I don't know that I can believe that because of whatever my thought is. We only have such a tiny fraction of the information of what God knows. And then again, remember, we're coming at it with a fallen brain. You know, we're starting from a premise of, of, of already fallenness. And then we, we, we go and say, God, I don't know, but you know what? I'm gonna just believe your word. I trust you. Uh, all your precepts, all your word is right, uh, what, no matter what I think. So I'm gonna stand on it. I love it. Great place to stand. The word of God is always right. Pay, 129, your testimonies are wonderful. Again, that's your word, God's testimonies. When the Bible talks about the great things God has done, he says they're wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Now notice this, when he says simple, he doesn't mean dumb. He just means, you know what, you may not be some scholar. I may not be a scholar, I'm no scholar, I can tell you that right now. You know, and, and if you're in the same boat, I'm not a scholar. We're just normal people loving the Lord and just, just basic people, what he's saying. We don't think, you, not to think of ourselves higher than we should. He says, if we simply love God's word, if we allow the entrance of his word, it gives light, it gives understanding to us. And I love the phraseology here. I love this little picture. The entrance of your words gives light. It's almost like you're there in this room and here with this great pomp and circumstance, God's word begins to come in. You're the Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't have understanding, but I'm gonna open up the bread of life. And all of a sudden, pam, 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 and the word of God just comes in. Whoa, the interest, there it is. And he comes in and begins to say, I'll show you things, things you'd never dreamed or imagined. He told Jeremiah, call on me. I'll show you great and wonderful things you've never known. And you don't have to be special. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to have some kind of supernatural wisdom. God supernaturally will show you. It's just the entrance of his word. You bring his word in and light begins to, to just illuminate the situation and show you what you're supposed to do. I opened my mouth and panted. Again, a picture of an animal here that's needing a drink. For I longed for your commandments. Reminds me of as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants after you, Lord. I long for them. Look upon me and be merciful to me, as your custom is toward those who love your name. You know, God, that's your custom. For those who love your name, you look upon us. Do you love the name of the Lord tonight? Now, what is the name of the Lord? Remember, it's who he is. His name is his character. It's everything he stands for, everything he is. Do you love what he stands for? Do you love his character? Do you love his righteousness, his word, his, what he says is right as compared to what man says is right? Do you love that? He says, Lord, if you love that, if the, your custom is to bless those who love your name. And so bless me because of that. Direct my steps by your word. Do you need your steps directed tonight? Lord, which way do I go? He said, you'll find the answer in his word. Direct my steps by your word. And let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant. Again, it reminds me of the ironic uh, blessing. And teach me your statutes. Rivers of water run down my eyes because men do not keep your law. Now this is a man that's in tune with God's spirit and he's watching his people around him just crumble because they're not keeping the word of God. It reminds me of Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet. Why? Because Jeremiah saw the nation disobeying God and Jeremiah having God's word on his, you know, on his lips every day, focusing on God's word, he could see what was happening. See, here's the frustrating thing for the Christian right now in America. And here's the frustrating thing for me as a pastor. I know the answer to restore America and get us back to a place where we're not falling apart. I know the answer. It's turning back to Jesus Christ. That is the answer. It is the only answer. The division we're seeing in our nation, the division we're seeing in the church, the only answer is Jesus Christ. It's not conferences, it's not conversations, it's Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you watch everybody trying everything else, you go, ah! If you would just listen to God's word, God would bring healing. If my people would humble themselves and pray, he said, and cry out for me, I'd heal their land. And it comes through prayer. It comes through seeking God in his word. And so what he's saying is, I recognize, even as Jeremiah saw the nation collapsing in front of his eyes, he began to weep and say, why won't you listen to God? God is speaking to you through his word. Why won't you listen? And I look at our nation today and think, why won't you listen to God? Why won't you pay attention to what's happening? People wonder, why are our cities falling apart? Why is everything collapsing? Because we need to get back to the word of God. That's the answer. Um, and yet, 
the, the, in tune, he's, he's, the weeping really is what this is. He's weeping because he sees what the problem is. He sees the answer, but people aren't listening. And so he finishes that one out and now comes to Sadi. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. So you're righteous and everything, your judgments, they're upright. You're, you're, you're right in all that you do. Your testimonies, which you've commanded, are righteous and very faithful. Again, God is a faithful God. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. It's like, again, that whole frustration of why won't they listen? Why won't you pay attention? Why don't you know the answer? It's, it's all in God's word. And notice he now jumps, again, talking about the purity of God's word. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. The Bible talks in another place about God's word is refined seven times. It's that number of completion, that whole picture of God's word is pure from beginning to end. And so he says, it's pure, your word is. That's where the answers are. And um, I'm small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. And again, that's how we are oftentimes as believers. We feel small, our voice isn't heard. Maybe we're despised because of the stand that we make. And yet he says, I'm not gonna forget your word. I'm standing on it. Because it will show itself to, to be true in the end. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. Everybody say, what is truth? Remember uh, Jesus when he talked to Pilate and he said, those who, who know me, those who believe in me, they hear my voice and you know, they, they, you know, my word is truth. He goes, what is truth? And he says, his word is truth. That's what truth is. So the same thing the Lord said, he's saying here, your law or your word is truth. If we want to know truth, we turn to the Bible. That's where truth is found. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me. Yet your commandments are my delights. Oh, do we delight in the command of the Lord? Do we delight in his word? God, give us a delight in your word. The righteousness of your testimonies are everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. So again, um, the exalting of God's word uh, in that particular uh, letter of Sadi. Now he comes to Kof. He says, I cry out with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. Again, the psalm is saying, not part of my heart, not just a little bit of my heart. I'm crying out to you with all of my heart. Every bit of it, Lord, is yours, and I'm giving it all. You know, not to get, uh, you know, grotesque about it, but sometimes, you know, uh, when I pray, I think about that. Lord, I want to give you my whole heart. And I'll think about just offering my whole heart up to the Lord, you know, and, and just everything's his, every bit of it. You know, it's a great prayer to pray. Got to give it all to you. And how easy it is to only give him part of our heart or try to take part of it back. Say, no, Lord, I want you to have all of it. I give it all to you. The psalmist is saying, I give you my whole heart, every bit of it. Hear me, Lord, I'll keep your statutes. I cry out to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I'll rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. And again, I don't want to belabor this too much, but you'll see this theme all through the Bible again rising early and getting into the word of God. Again, never get into where it's a work, never get to where you feel like you've got to earn something or you're not pleasing God if you're not doing whatever. That's not what this is about. But I encourage you, work on the discipline of getting up a little bit earlier and seeking God. There's nothing like seeking God in the morning. It's all through the Bible. God says over and over, I will rise early, I will seek you. Jesus was known for getting up and going out early to seek the Lord. And we, I know we all have different struggles with sleep and all that, I get that. And God has mercy. You know, the Bible says that God gives his beloved sleep. He's not asking you to, you know, stay in some state of, of, of zombieism all the time because you can't function. But you might look at your life and look at your schedule. Maybe go to bed a little bit earlier. You know, I found that for me, I would say, Lord, it's so hard to get up in the mornings. You know, it's so difficult to get up in the morning. It's funny, I have a huge struggle getting up in the morning. But once I'm, I'm awake, like for whatever the reason, that's when my brain's the liveliest. And I'll tell Tracy, I'm not a morning person. She's like, oh, yes, you are. Because like, I mean, it's... I'm, I'm sleepy as can be, but the brain's going. The rest of me is not up, but my brain for somehow gets going. I don't know what happens there. But you know, as I begin to think, Lord, I'm so tired in the mornings. God, help me, help me. And I begin to think, well, just maybe go to bed a little earlier. That's hard to do, especially if you have patterns of staying up later. And, it's, you know, not going to bed super early, but trying to get, maybe, maybe go to bed, you know, 15 minutes earlier, 30 minutes or try it and try to get up 15 minutes sooner. There's something special about that morning time. It's quiet. The busyness of the day hasn't begun. Remember, they would go out to get the manna, which represents the word of God. They would go out every morning they, and God put it there for them in the morning. There's something very symbolic about that. And they would go and gather it in the morning. And remember, if they waited too late, the sun came up and literally melted the manna. Whatever manna was, it would melt in the sunlight. 
And there's a picture of that as well. We wait too late to get started in the day in the word of God, it just melts away. It gets busy, life starts happening. And so I encourage you, you know, pray to the Lord, God help me to wake up, you know, help me to, whatever I need to do to get up, help me to do that. I rise before the dawning of the morning and I cry for help, I hope in your word. And again, some, some of the sweetest moments of my life have been in the morning with the Lord. My eyes are awake through the night watches. So sometimes I pray at night, the psalmist is saying that I may meditate on your word. Again, if you find yourself awake, it's a good time maybe to meditate on the word of God. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me according to your justice. Here's another revive me. Remember we saw revive me according to your word and I saying revive me according to your justice. And that is, Lord, I'm seeking you. So because I'm seeking you, then hear my prayer and by your justice, honoring the fact that I'm seeking you, revive me. See, what a great prayer to pray. Lord, I'm seeking you and I'm not really getting filled. What's going on, God? According to your justice, is it not just that you pour your spirit out on me because I'm praying, I'm seeking you, I'm asking you to fill me? Is it not just that you would do that, God? So you see the psalmist here making his complaint before God, making his cry before God, but a great way for us to pray as well. Lord, I could be anywhere. I could have stayed home tonight and watched a movie. I could have gone and seen a ball game. I could have just whatever. I could have just any number of things I could have done. But Lord, I'm here tonight hearing your word. Based on that, God, revive me. Tell me what I need to hear. You know my situation right now in my family. You know my situation at work. You know my situation of what I need to hear. Well, I'm here tonight honoring you, God. And so would you, would you honor me now? And would you revive me according to your justice? Would you speak to me by your word? He'll do it. He's probably doing it right now. They draw near who follow after wickedness and they're far from your law. You are near, O oh Lord. I love that. And all your commandments are truth. He goes, the enemy draws near, but you know what, God? You're near as well. They may be near, but you're nearer. You're here with me. You're, 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 you're living in my heart. And we can say that today. He lives within us. And notice again, all your commandments, not some of them, all of your commandments are truth. And again, never try to pick which parts of the Bible you want to believe and which parts of the Bible you don't. He's not a smorgasbord. He's the whole package. Jesus said, I'm in the volume of the book. It means every bit of it. From head to toe, it's Jesus. Starting in Genesis, ending in Revelation. If you want to see all of Jesus, you've got to look at all of the Bible. He said, I'm in the volume of the book. He told the Pharisees and Sadducees of his day, he said, you search the scriptures looking for life, but it's me they speak of. And he was talking about the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't even written yet. He says, that's me you're reading about. You know, we think about Leviticus. Oh, Leviticus, it's so hard to read Leviticus. All the sacrifices, how beautiful it is to read Leviticus. Look at the sacrifices and look for Jesus. It will blow your mind. They took the animal, they cut it in pieces and placed it upon the wood and made it an offering to the Lord. They took Jesus' body, they cut him to pieces with a whip and they placed his body on the wood and offered it to the Lord. It's all through there, every bit of it. And so when you read through parts of Lord, why, why is this here? Show me you, Lord. Show me Jesus in this. And God will begin to just explode the word of God to you by his spirit. And so, um, again, all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I've, I've known of old that you have founded them forever. So his word is established in heaven forever. And again, by the way, this whole thing of God's word is ancient. Maybe the way it's written is, but you can't outdate something that is outside of time his word is eternal. There, you can't put a date on it. It's, it's always existed. It always will exist. It's just written in different languages. It's amazing to me, uh, you know, how some people think, well, because it uses a different form of speech, then that means that it's, you know, uh, somehow outdated. No, it's, it's what, how the men spoke in that day. It's how they wrote in that day. It's what they did in that day. And no, it's, it's God, I've known from old, you founded it forever. Now we come to Resh, Resh, we would say. Um, he says, consider my affliction and deliver me for I do not forget your law. Lord, have mercy on me again. These are all prayers to pray to God. I encourage you, go through this psalm. Pray the psalms to the Lord. You let, just lay a psalm out and pray it to God from your heart. Here's a great one. Lord, consider my affliction and deliver me. Why? Because I didn't forget your law. I'm reading your word. I'm praying over your word. I'm applying your word. I'm living by your word. So God, remember me. This is a prayer you know will get answered. Plead my cause and redeem me. Here's another revive me. Revive me according to your word. And he goes back to the word. He mentioned that earlier. And then he mentions revive me according to your justice. Now revive me according to your, to your word. Uh, he's going to go further than that just a moment. Salvation is far from the wicked for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Now again, this is again, notice this. This is the God of the Old Testament. People, the God of the Old Testament is a, a mean God. People, it's the same God. 
There's no difference in the God of the Old Testament and the New. And notice it talks about the Old Testament God. Great are your what? Not just your mercies, your tender mercies. Look at the adjective to describe the mercies of God. They're tender. Yeah, for God's enemies, he is to be feared, right? But for those who love him, his mercies are tender. You know, I love it. Tender mercies, O Lord. And now another revive me. Look at this. Revive me according to your judgments. I love it. So God, I need to be revived based on your judgments. Judge God that I've come through the blood. Judge that I'm depending on you and not myself. And because of that, revive me based on your judgments, on your word. Many are the persecutors and the enemies, or are my persecutors rather, and my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. Again, he goes back to this theme over and over of, I'm being attacked by all these people, but I continue to run to your word. What a great thing to do when you get attacked by your enemies. Run to God's word, run to God's word, run to God's word. That's where you're gonna find your hope and your strength. And that's where you're gonna be built up in the Lord. And so, uh, you know, Lord, you're the one that I turn to. Again, I'm, I, I, I'm gonna keep your testimonies. I see the treacherous and I'm disgusted because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness. There's another revive me. This time it's loving kindness. So we've seen judgments, word, uh, justice, now loving kindness to be revived, if you will. Uh, so Lord, according to your goodness, you're a loving God. And because you're loving, you see that I'm trying to seek you. You see that I'm trying to get in the word. You see that I'm trying to be filled with the spirit. You see, God, that I'm seeking you. I'm not like just sitting around goofing off, Lord. I may not be doing everything right, but I'm applying myself to you. So God, based on that, on your loving kindness, send me revival. Revive me, Lord. Give me a new love for your word, a new heart for you, for your people. You know, I think one of the greatest prayers you can pray is, God, make me a, a person of love. That's the greatest thing, guys, is to be loving. If we can learn to love, you know, that's a supernatural work of the Spirit. Then, well, I do love. Yeah, but loving like God loves, you know? I mean, you know, one of the hard things about for young pastors, you know, and, and I went through this, and I see other young pastors. Not that there's love not there. That, certainly there's love there. But the focus is so much just on the Word of God and teaching the Word and studying God's Word and trying to direct people the right way, which all should be there. Um, that oftentimes you hear things, well, our pastor, you know, he, he, he teaches the word and all, but it's just not as loving as I, you know, whatever. I've heard people say, I'm like, you know, how old is he? Well, he's kind of young. Well, give him time to grow. You know, just pray for him. You know, is he feeding you? Yeah, well, then get fed. Get fed and let God grow him in that place. I think about Peter when he was talking to the Lord. The Lord said, Peter, do you love me? You know that whole thing. Three times, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, right? You know, again, it's kind of like, your love isn't where it needs to be yet, Peter. He said, Lord, you know that I like you. Again, that's the whole play on words there in the, in the Greek language. One is the Lord keeps saying, do you love me? And Peter's like, you know I like you. Peter, do you love me? You know that I like you. Peter, do you love me? You know that I like you. Why do you keep asking me that? Because Peter had to be honest. He knew that the Lord could see right through to his heart. He knew that he loved him like a brother or liked him like a brother. It's the word phileo where we get Philadelphia, the, you know, the city of brotherly love. He realized, I, if I loved you the way I should, I wouldn't have denied you three times. You know it, I know it okay, what's the conversation about? I'm restoring you, Peter. I'm giving you an opportunity now to restore, and I want you to acknowledge that you don't love me like you should. That's okay. I just want you to know where you are. Know where you are, and from there, I'll grow you, okay? Don't panic over it. Just recognize it. Lord, I don't love like I should. I don't do what I should, but you see it, so take me to a new place. And I love what he told Peter. He said, look, you don't agape the flock yet. You don't love people more than yourself. You don't even love me like you should but feed them, love them. Just feed them, feed them, feed them. If you do that, you are loving me. You're showing love. And so again, there's this whole idea of just, you know, growing in that love and, 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 and asking to be, you know, it's loving kindness. It's God's loving kindness that revives us. And so we need to be revived. Just go to the Lord and tell him, I'm not where I need to be, but God, by your loving kindness, do a work in me, do it. Again, he ends this psalm with, I love it. The entirety of your word is truth. I love how he keeps driving the whole, just these precious jewels about God's word back to back to back. Every bit of it, every word of it, every part of it. You know, the, the, the rabbis say that even the spaces between the words are, are ordained and that they're anointed, they're God breathed. Now, again, I don't know if there's a scripture to back that the spaces, you know, between the words are or whatever, but I know that God says his word is God breathed. And every bit of it, Jesus himself said, not one jot or tittle will pass, not the smallest little mark, not the smallest little thing's gonna pass every, until all of it comes to pass. 
And so he says, the entirety of your word is truth. By the way, if God has been 100% accurate up to this point, and if he's promised that none of his word will ever pass away that won't come to pass, we can rest assured the rest of it's gonna take place. So you wanna, is, is God really gonna complete this? Are all these things really gonna happen the Bible tells us about? Count on it. it, it God, his word will not fail. His word is staked on it. His, 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 who he is, his name. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I love it. What a great psalm. Or eight verses of that psalm. Two more to go here. Sheen, look at this. Now he talks about the government being against him. This is something that really is applicable to today. We see, again, more government pressure on the church and on believers. He says, princes persecute me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. You know, Lord, the government may be breathing down my neck or maybe this and that. And again, it may not be long until it may be illegal to say certain things. Or, I mean, you look at what's happening in Canada already. You cannot speak against certain things in Canada or you will get legally in trouble as a pastor. Pray for Canada. Pray not only for Cuba, pray for our brothers and sisters in Canada. I never would think I'd be saying that, but pray for them. Why? There are some 45 churches that have been burned down here in the last few months in Canada. Think about that. The government's saying they can't teach the word of God. They'll, they'll find them and do all these things. So again, princes persecute me without a cause might be the cry of the pastor in Canada. It would be the cry of the pastor in Cuba and different places. But my heart stands in awe of your word. That is, I'm not gonna leave your word. I'm gonna continue to teach it. I'm gonna stand in it and I'm in awe of it. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. You ever find great treasure? You know, you think about that as a kid. You know, well, great treasure. What would be great treasure as an adult? Probably be a lot higher standard for great treasure. But I can remember swimming in the, you know, the community swimming pool as a kid and diving to the bottom and finding those quarters and dimes, you know, that some, some foolish kid lost as he was swimming across, you know. And I would save them up and go buy be a big juicy ice cream, you know. And I just, I would dive and find coins and get ice creams. And the big prize was getting enough to actually go buy a thing of French fries. That was the big prize for me. But you just swim all day, you know, look and find all these coins down there. And you're like, ha, 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 you know, whatever. Anyway, that was great treasure to me. You're a kid, right? And I remember how excited I got when I found that. Listen, when you're swimming in God's word, there's just great treasures. Lord, I needed that. Wow, I never saw that before. You've got to be kidding me. That explains that, Lord. Now I understand. I love it when God shows me new things. I never understood that, Lord. Now I get it. I see it. It comes from swimming in the word of God. If you don't swim in the word of God and sometimes dig to the bottom, you know, look for the treasure that God has dropped. And God puts these surprises out there, you know, and you find them. They're like treasure. He says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you. And again, did he literally seven times? Maybe seven times also in scripture is complete. So I, I praise you in a complete way throughout the day because of your righteous judgments. Look at this one. Here's one to hold on to if you don't have peace tonight. Great peace have those who love your law. Do you have peace tonight? Do you have great peace? If you want great peace, develop a love for God's word. God, I don't have peace. My life is in turmoil. Then say, God, I need you to give me a love for your law because I don't have peace. So give me love for your law. I'm gonna read it. You promise you would do this, Lord. I need your peace. And as you begin to love the word of God, you know why great peace comes when you love the word of God? Because it, 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 it makes us rest in assurance of who he is, the promises that he gives, the fact that we win at the end. I mean, the worst it gets down here is, is, is just a precursor to the eternity of joy in heaven. And so we have great peace. We have hope. And that hope is renewed by loving the Lord and loving his law. So great peace have those. And nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, it's your word keeps me steady. Lord, I hope for your salvation. Again, I find hope in your word. And I do your commandments. I'm not just hearing them, I'm doing them. My soul keeps your testimonies and I love them exceedingly. Again, look at his heart for God's word. I love this. I keep your precepts and your testimonies for all my ways are before you. That is, Lord, you see everything anyway. And so I'm, it's all before you. There's nothing to hide. And I, but I keep your precepts and your testimonies. And by the way, I think when you go to God in prayer, it's good to remember that God sees everything anyway. Don't just, just be who you are before God. You can't hide something from him anyway. He sees everything. You know, if, if there's a, a wicked thought that's in your mind, he sees it. Lord, I know you see what I've been thinking about. Okay, we can pretend and I can just like pray all these things and not bring that up. But you see it, you know it. I don't want that anymore. 
Would you deliver me based on your loving kindness? By your word, would you wash me? Would you purify? Would you remove these things from my mind and from my heart, Lord? And one of the greatest things of coming to the Lord for me was I had all these horrible images and things in my mind that I'd planted over the years as a child growing up. Whether it be looking at things I shouldn't look at or seeing movies I shouldn't, even horror type things, you know, being afraid. You know, like, you, you, I, I remember as a kid, I don't know why, 12 years old, I'm watching Jaws. What, 12 years old, and you may think, well, that's no big deal. I'll tell you, for me, I wouldn't get in a swimming pool for the whole summer. I wouldn't. I'd get in the swimming pool after dark. If it's daytime, I would. I'd get in the swim, go on vacation. I'm in the swimming pool, it's dark, and all I could hear was, bottom. You know, somebody, the water starts. Oh, it's a great wife. Said, no, it's, that, that's your dad. No. <laughs> anyway, whatever. So many images, so many things that the mind needed to be purified from. And God just removed them. I mean, I remember I grew up as a, a, a pastor's kid, right? And you had the, 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 the churches. You see, the churches seemed really creepy at night. And sometimes you have to go in the church and get something at night. It's really creepy. I was like, man, he's like, somebody could die in this place. You know, it's like, there's killers by every corner. And I would imagine, I remember one time imagining there was monsters in there. I was a little kid. I could see red eyes looking at me. You know, the, the imagination of a kid, right? And then now I can, I can come in here any time of the day or night. All the lights are out. I never, there's no fear in my heart. I'm not thinking, well, this is creepy because it's dark. It's like, no matter where I go, I'm not afraid anymore. This is what God does. He delivers us from these things. He washes our mind clean. He gives us, you know, purity of thought, you know, and, and, and cleanses us from this stuff that we have these battles that we go through and all. And it's just, you know, again, uh, I keep your precepts, your testimonies, all my ways are before you see them all anyway. And so, Lord, I'm not going to be afraid to tell them to you. And again, as we pour our heart out, then God can minister to us in whatever area that we're struggling with mentally or emotionally. Pour it out. He knows it. Share it with him. Come to the last one, Tao. And this is where we'll finish tonight. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. There it is again. If you don't have understanding, ask him. God, I'm going to read your word. Give me understanding in my situation based on your word. According to your word, I need understanding. God will do it. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. So God, I've got something I need to be delivered from. Let me find deliverance in just reading the word of God. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. I love it. The Holy Spirit. Paul said, you don't need teachers. The Holy Spirit teaches you. I mean, God gives us teachers, and I'm thankful. I love hearing teachers on the radio. I love listening to teaching. I, I, love, I grow from that. I get fed. We need that. But he says, you, I'll teach you. The Holy Spirit, if you'll spend time with the Lord, he will teach you. My tongue shall speak of your word. Does our tongue speak of the word of God? What does our tongue speak of, you know? should be speaking the word of God and it should be speaking of God's word. You know, you're struggling. Go to God's word. We should be telling people, read the Bible. Get in the word of God. Read it and tell them where to start. You know, I don't know where to start. Start in John. Read the book of John. So give them some place to start, you know? And, and he says, my tongue will speak of your word for all your commandments are righteous. Again, there's the whole encompassing, all of them, not some. Let your hand become my help for I've chosen your precepts. Lord, I've chosen you and because of that, uh, you know, Reward me. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Again, Lord, make your law our delight. He said that earlier. So we need to, his law should be our delight. Let my soul live and it shall praise you and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Notice this, even though he's seeking God so firmly and so hardly, he still says, or in such a firm way, not hardly. <laughs> but if I'm seeking the Lord in such a, a pure way and a, and a complete way, he says, I'm still like a lost sheep. We still have a, a you know, we sang tonight, prone to wander, you know, right? We're prone to wander. And, 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 and so bring us back, Lord. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. God, come after me. I love the fact that the Lord comes after us for I do not forget your commandments. So we finish Psalm 119. What a great Psalm. Again, I encourage you, go back, read through it, pray over each of them, you know, take a section and pray over it. Say, God, speak to me from your word. Pray over the word of God. Let it soak in all these promises, all these things the psalmist is asking for. You need to ask for them. I need to ask for them because if our love for the word grows, we're gonna be spending more time in the word. And if we spend more time in the word, we're gonna grow in God's word. We're gonna be purified by the word. We're gonna become more like Jesus and we're gonna know him better. You can't lose by getting the word of God. You only gain. 
So run to the word of God and let it be your all in all because that's what it is. It's our all in all. So let's pray for God to give us that love, to give us that hunger, to give us that fire. And again, just pray, especially if tonight we don't have that hunger for the word of God, to give us that hunger for God's word and just to delight in it. You guys, if we delight in the word of God, we're gonna see our lives just explode for Jesus. Your individual lives. It's not even about just what God's gonna do in the church. But your individual life is gonna become something that people are gonna recognize. There's gonna be a life to you. There's gonna be a fragrance to your life. There's gonna be fruit that other people can enjoy. That very testimony, people are gonna say, what is it about you? And then say, my tongue will speak of the word of the Lord, even as the psalmist did. Let me tell you about Jesus. I love it. Let's pray. Lord, again, give us a hunger for your word. We read the psalmist all through Psalm 119. Talk about your word being our delight. And then you talk about the the rejoicing of our heart, Lord. You talk about reviving us according to your word and your justice and your judgments and your loving kindness and all these things. God, give us a hunger for your word. Revive us according to your word. Give us life according to your word. God, pour your word into us as we read it. Pour your spirit upon us as we read it. God, let our lives be lit up by your word and by your spirit and let it have an impact on those around us. God, take the word that was planted in our hearts tonight and let make it grow, Lord. Water it. Pour your oil upon it. Just give us a new hunger. God, for those of us that may be dry tonight, God, revive each heart in here that might be dry. God, I pray you put a a desire and an ability to rise, even if it's just a little bit earlier in the morning, God, to seek you, to sit in the green pastures of your word in the morning in the quiet. Let the dew of heaven rest on us and refresh us. Lord, as we just sing to you and worship you and bless you. So Father, we love you. We love your word. We love, God, the ministry of your spirit tonight. So we soak it in, God, and let us leave here filled and rejoicing. And now that you've poured into us, let us now, Lord, pour out to you as we sing and give a sacrifice of praise, leaving this place, Lord, giving you honor and glory. We love you, Lord. We bless you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand